All right, how's it going, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Forward Thinking Founders, where we're talking to founders about their companies, their visions for the future, and how the two collide. Except for today, today we are not talking to a founder. We're talking to someone on the other side of the table. Uh, this is, I believe, the second installment in the VC Monday uh, deal partner meeting, whatever the series I'm gonna call it. This is it. Today, I'm very excited to be talking to Zach Slayback, who is a principal at 1517 Fund. And today we're jamming on the other side of the table. Zach, welcome to the, slow, the show. How's it going? Thanks for having me on, Matt. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I am obviously still getting this intro down for the, for the VC side of things, but I'll, I'll figure it out at some point. How is, uh, how is your, your day going? How are your, uh, how are your holidays at getting back in the swing of things? Oh, you know, busy. Like, like we were saying before we started recording, uh, a goofy thing about the industry is like half the industry shuts down from like November to January. So, you know, getting back on top of emails with investors, you know, following up with people, things like that. So a lot of phone calls. Yeah, definitely. Well, to kick this off, I want to give the listeners a little bit of the lay of the land of just kind of where you're coming from. So can you kind of describe what 1517 Fund is and mm -hmm. what you do there, just on, on a high level or mid-level? Yeah, we're a uh, pre-seed firm uh, that was spun out of Peter Thiel's fellowship program. So my colleagues, our partners, Michael Gibson, Daniel Strachman, uh, co-founded the Thiel Fellowship with Peter back in 2010, 2011. Uh, and we make investments in people like Thiel Fellows, not just Thiel Fellows, but people like Thiel Fellows. So we like young, uncredentialed founders working outside of tract institutions. Uh, a lot of our investments are in dropouts. Uh, we do some deep tech investments, so like space, nuclear, things like that. Uh, but we're typically trying to work with people at the earliest stages possible. We have a grant program where we'll give out $1,000 cash grants when people are like, like right at the idea stage. A lot of those uh, end up becoming portfolio companies where we are often the very first institutional check into the company. Uh, we do a lot of software, a lot of hardware, like I said, some deep tech. Uh, so it's more like there are certain industries we really don't do. Uh, and we, we like, I personally like enterprise SaaS. I know that's kind of cliche, but it's, it's a model that, that I'm particularly interested in. And then we do a lot of hardware as well. So let's start there in interest. So obviously you just mentioned that your, that the, the fund has many different interests in different verticals, but you specifically are interested in enterprise SaaS. So if a founder is listening, um, you know, in the here that you're interested in enterprise SaaS, is that something where, where you only will talk to companies in that space or that's just where you have a unique interest? Um, oh no. I, I mean, I'll, I'll talk to companies in, uh, we're, weirdly accessible so i'll talk to companies probably in any space um if for me in particular you know there are certain things about enterprise SaaS that i can latch on to really easily uh, i used to do some business development i've done some consulting so i i have an idea of what that process looks like um customer development is is a lot more straightforward uh and i and i think it's one of these things where it's like for me to understand enterprise SaaS is a lot easier then in my world, based on my background, then for me to understand like consumer, right? Uh, I, I heard my colleague Danielle put it really well one day uh, when we were on the phone with someone. Uh, in order to know consumer well, you have to know what's cool. And in order to know what's cool, you have to be cool. And none of us are cool. <laughs> so it's hard to really do consumer well. So the flip side of that is, is enterprise. Um, so I, you know, I, I like tools that are uh, good for like remote teams. Um, I like tools that are good across multiple cloud apps, things like that. Um, but we, I'll talk to companies across the, across industries. And you mentioned that you, when introducing kind of the, the fund, that it's a pre-seed fund. So can you kind of, define it, what that means for you and if there's anything too early i think in, th in this case is there a point where a company can be too late to approach you yeah both are true uh i will preface everything i'm about to say with uh the funding landscape has changed a lot in the last couple of years it's changed a lot even since you know i started working in the industry which is relatively recently 
so what I say right now, you know, it's early January might be completely out the like six months, hopefully not. Um, but pre-seed for us typically means, you know, you have a handful of users, you might have a, a few paid pilots, uh, but you're, you haven't really raised institutional capital yet. Uh, numbers wise, it typically means somebody's raising between 500 K and $1.5 million. Uh, what the cap looks like, you know, obviously changes based on the traction, based on where they're geographically located, based on what the market conditions are at the time. Uh, but the way I like to think about it is, um, how much are you raising? How much traction do you have? And is there institutional money already in the company? Right. Uh, an ideal case for us is somebody comes to us and maybe they've raised an angel round, maybe they did a friends and family round, uh, but they're putting together, you know, 500K, million dollars, something like that. Uh, they want a few venture capital funds to come in and then they're going to fill the rest out with maybe angels. So that happens fairly often. Um, if somebody is, you know, pre revenue, it really depends on if we've worked with them previously. If they're in an industry where the capital expenses to get started are just very, very high. So uh, we've done a few pre-revenue deals for like deep tech. Uh, but in deep tech, there are like other indicators that you can look for that quite aren't traction, but are similar to traction. So like government, con um, government grants is one of those things that you can look for. Um, things like that. Uh, as far as if somebody's too late, yeah, if they're just raising, you know, more than one half million dollars, it, the economics doesn't work out for us to, for us to be able to invest. You know, we very fundamentally follow a portfolio theory that's popularized in zero to one, which is that uh, venture capital uh, portfolios follow a power law distribution for returns. So every investment we're making, we're thinking about, okay, how can this company be the one that earns back the rest of the fund? And when you're investing, you know, relatively small checks later in the game, you just don't have enough ownership for it to make sense. I actually want to get into this. When I was a, I mean, when I was a founder and will be a founder in the future, I think portfolio construction is something that I never really heard about. I, I really didn't know much about, but now that I'm not necessarily on the other side of the table, but like I'm, I'm objectively just observing other people going through the process and also doing this interview. I realize how important that is. So portfolio construction and economics, can you dive into you know, what you mean? What does economics for a VC firm even mean? What do you mean by that? And then second, why should a founder care or should a founder care about, about those economics? Yeah, uh, we have a great essay on our blog called The Anti-Pitch Playbook, uh, where we break down everything we look for in pitches. Uh, and a big part of that is, is market and economics. And I, I can send a link for that and you can include that in the show notes if you want. Um, but in broad strokes, you know, we raise the, one of the things I, I, I always tell people in portfolio theory and, uh, market size. And this question that we're digging into right now is probably personally the biggest reason why I end up passing on companies that I'm otherwise pretty interested in, or I think they've got great teams, or it's a really interesting product. I just can't get to the point where I think like, okay, this makes sense with the portfolio theory. So fundamentally, it's important to keep in mind that what venture capitalists do is they raise money from rich people, from institutions, from endowments, from all these other kinds of places, and then they deploy that capital. The idea being that they're going to be better at finding private investments than the like CIO at a foundation will be, right? Because we're just closer to it and our jobs day to day are to be on the phone, to be out, to be on campus, do all these things that people at the family office or a foundation or wherever can't do, right? In order for us to compellingly do that, we need to not just say that we'll get them, that we'll return a little bit of their money, but that in the seven to 10 years, it tends to take uh, for an early stage fund to have an, enough exits to have liquidity for its investors uh, that will return uh, 3x net on their capital, right? Uh, so that means if you're working on a $20 million fund, you're actually going to be making $80 million in seven to 10 years because you need to return the initial 20 million to your investors, and then you need to return the 3x on top of that. Um, there's lots of reasons why that's the, the market rate. Um, 
biggest reason is just going to be the opportunity cost of the, those funds. Uh, the reality is right now, uh, we've been in a bull market for something like a decade. Uh, and in a lot of cases, if someone's, you know, if someone doesn't really love venture, the best thing they can do with their money is just put it into the stock market. Uh, so you have to have a compelling reason to them that you, you're able to not just beat the stock market, to, but to really beat the stock market, right? And in order to do that, I mean, those are just massive numbers, right? When you're thinking about the fact that a venture capital firm might own a few percentage points in a company pre-Series A, up to Series A, and then uh, increasingly smaller slice of the pie as dilution increases as the company goes to Series B, Series C, Series D, whatever, and gets to IPO. Uh, so you have to be thinking to yourself, okay, how do I make my tiny, tiny slice of this company worth so much of the portfolio. And one of the variables that's really important to keep in mind, not only how do I make this tiny, tiny slice of the company valuable, uh, but also most of the companies in my portfolio are gonna go out of business because that's just how early stage companies work. You don't know which ones, right? So when you're making the investment, you need to get to a place where you think like, okay, this company could be the one that in a decade is going to earn back the fund. Now, of course, you know, partners and, and firms can hedge on this a little bit and they can say like, okay, if we look at the portfolio, we're pretty confident about these investments we previously made. The downside on this specific investment is relatively low. Maybe it's just like a little bit of icing on the cake, right? But generally speaking, what you want to think about is how does this return the rest of the fund, assuming everything else fails? There's a chart in zero to one uh, that explains this, this idea, which it shows uh, an X, Y axis of what people think a venture capital portfolio looks like, where it says, you know, the, the ranks of the companies are your, your top ranking company maybe does like 8X, then your next company does 7X, then your next company does 6X, and your next company does 5X, right? But it's really more like your top ranking company does like 20X and everything else is like either zero or like one or two X, right? Um, so you have to be asking yourself, not just how do I make that tiny slice valuable, but how do I make that tiny slice val so valuable that assuming the rest of the portfolio goes to zero, I'm going to be able to earn back market returns for my investors. Uh, and that's hard. <laughs> that's really, really hard. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of work outside of the Bay Area. We, we have an office in the Bay Area and uh, I'm on the East Coast and then I have a colleague in the Midwest and uh, outside of the Bay Area and outside of New York City in particular, uh, it's, you just don't get a lot of people having this conversation. So a lot of people will come to you with companies that are really fantastic companies, great founders, really cool products, might have fantastic traction, but they're not what you would call venture scalable. So when people are talking about venture scalable, that sense of economics, what I just described to you is fundamentally what they're talking about. Now, firms have a lot of different ways that they can double down on the companies that they think will be successful. Uh, you know, firms will set aside a certain amount of money for follow on funding. Uh, but you, when you're making that initial investment, you have to be thinking to yourself like, okay, assuming we're going to be doing follow on funding in this company out of this fund, how do we earn back the, the principal on the fund, and then what we are, have promised to our investors that we will return to them. So that's extremely useful and helpful information. I want to keep kind of going deeper into the last thing you mentioned, which is follow on funding. Mm -hmm. This is a realm where I still actually don't understand this too well. So maybe you can clarify it for me. So um, there's this thing called pro rata, which like to my, to my, you know, my, my definition of that is we have the right to invest to keep our stake in your company for, you know, forever, pretty much. Um, is pro rata the same? Is it equivalent to follow on funding? Or it's a type of follow on funding. So it's, it's a type it's, of follow. Cool. Can you, can you kind of go through, if I'm a founder, I raise money from 15, 17. How do I think about it, like leaving space for you? The, and, yeah, the, the, the best way of thinking about what pro rata means is, uh, without getting into you know, the specifics of, of it and thinking about it broadly, is when an investor invests in the, in the company, if they're, they're, going to tip, they're going to typically ask that you agree to pro rata rights should they choose to follow on. When they follow on, they expect to be able to follow on a certain amount. That's their pro rata. Now, 
if you don't respect the pro rata or if you're unable to respect the pro rata, that doesn't necessarily mean they can't follow on. But usually what that means is they're not able to follow on at the amount and the level of ownership that they thought that they could follow on at. That's the simplest way of explaining it. So it's like you uh, come in and you buy, you know, and this is really, really simplifying because most people do it early stage on notes or on safes, but let's assume it's a price round, right? You come in and you buy like 1% of the company and you're assuming in the next round, you're going to be able to buy up to, you know, 1.5%, right? Uh, that's, that would be your pro rata. If the founders came back and said, you know, like, look, you know, this, this other firm that's leading the round is eating up lots of the round. We don't have room for you. We're going to have to ask you to take 1.1. Uh, that would mean you typically you'd say like you'd get a, you, you're getting a haircut on your pro rata, right? Um, and pro rata is really important to venture capital firms, especially early stage firms, because that few percentage points can be a, a big big difference for them. Um, typically, for the later stage firms that will, can crowd them out, or for uh, even the founding teams, the the percentages are not as big of an impact as they are for the firm. So that's one of the reasons why pro rata is really important to these smaller firms and to professional angel investors. From the founder perspective, is pro rata, is pro rata kind of a negotiating kind of like a tactic for a VC? Like in a perfect world, would a founder not let any VC take pro rata because it just potentially hurts them in the future? Or is that, am I thinking about that the wrong way? I wouldn't say it hurts them. I think it's part of like the incentive for investing in the company and, and working with that company in particular saying like, Hey, if we think that you're really, really, we're really, really bullish on you. We want to keep supporting you and we will support you at the expense of, uh, of our opportunity cost. Right. Um, ideally it shouldn't be a, a negotiating point between the VC and, and the founder. Um, typically when I've seen pro rata from, from my perspective, my limited perspective, what I've seen is, it's usually not anything about the founders. It's usually more that uh, there's a later stage firm that's just writing much larger checks. And a founder might think that their round's gonna be $15 million, thinking that their lead might put in seven and a half, but the lead puts in 10. Uh, so then it's like, okay, well, you know, $2.5 million just got eaten up by that lead. What, what are you gonna do with that 2.5, right? Where's that gonna come from? So. Yeah, that, that, that's very helpful. Uh, thanks for kind of going into that. So before we started recording, you mentioned that it's the start of the year and you and it seems like the rest of your team are, are in fundraising mode. Um, can you, which means, does that mean you're raising potentially a fund? Is that what you mean by fundraising mode when you, when you say? Yeah, we, we announced our second fund last year. So uh, every every venture capital firm within the structure be under the hood is, like I said, venture capital firms raise money from other investors and they raise that to a fund, right? And that specific fund is the vehicle out of which those checks are written for a company, right? So we would we would say we made something like 40 investments out of 15, 17 fund one, and now we're making investments and raising money for 15, 17 fund two. Um, that's what you would say in that regard. Okay. Now that I'm talking about this, I, I hate to do this to you, Matt. I'm sorry. Um, no worries. The SEC has really weird rules about whether or not you can say you're fundraising publicly. Oh, I totally uh, set you up to fail. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, should, I, I should have clarified that. I had completely forgotten about it. I'm like, no. why am I no, I know you're talking about. I can't talk about it publicly because it's illegal. <laughs> ah, sorry. Like I can, I can talk to you about it, but if this could be yeah. construed as, as as marketing, which it could be, I understand. Um, that would be problematic. So cool. So th so then I'll scrap that question. So that I asked yeah. you. Cool. You got it. So where I was, what I was trying to let me think. What? Um. Okay. What? What? The question I'm trying to get at is like, does well, actually, let me now that we're like, let me actually pause it. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that you know VCs they have to raise money too uh, to 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 invest. Um, does do, does a founder that wants to raise money from a VC do they should they care at all about the schedules of when a VC is raising money, what fund they're investing out of? Um, how, how much does that matter to a founder? 
It can matter to the extent that uh, sometimes you'll find VCs, they shouldn't do this. Uh, and it's uh, something that I would encourage founders if you're talking to a VC and they are doing this, that's a huge, like, they're, they're, they are doing this and they're hiding it from you. That's a huge yellow flag. Sometimes VC firms will say that they're going to invest in a company, but they don't have the money to invest. So that makes a founder believe that they're going to be getting a check that the VC hasn't fundraised yet. So what I would encourage a founder to do is, you know, ask the, the firm at a certain place, like, you know, are you able to make commitments, right? Or how much gunpowder do you have? How much powder do you have that's dry, right? Um, ideally, like the firm should have a sense of that and they should have a sense of like how many investments they should be able to make based on their current capital call schedule. But unfortunately, like you'll find people that maybe they're just a little more optimistic about how much money they're going to have at a certain point. Um, maybe they're just in too enthusiastic about encouraging uh, investments that they can't afford. Um, I would always encourage a founder, you know, if you're getting to that stage, just, you know, you can ask them, you know, how often do you make investments, right? That, that's one way of kind of getting at it without being overly aggressive. Uh, and then when they're more interested, you can ask them, great, you know, um, what's your typical timeline look like, right? And are you, how much powder do you guys have dry to make an investment right now? Yeah, that uh, that definitely makes sense. Um, and is I mean, is there a time where? Well, it actually talks about the, the transparency that the founder tries to potentially get out from an investor. Um, you said if a, if a founder maybe asks too many questions about this, they might be perceived as like aggressive. Um, they shouldn't that, be. They shouldn't be. But you know, I, I there this industry unfortunately has a lot of people who. Um, they, they could take it the wrong way. I don't know. I, I wouldn't be offended if somebody was asking me a bunch of questions like how much capital do you, can you guys commit? What's your, um, you know, how much powder do you have dry? Things like that. Uh, but I know that when I say these things to founders, sometimes I see them shrink away a little bit as if it's like, there's a weird power dynamic here. And I would just encourage them like, just be more confident. Like the, if, if you're fundraising and if you're getting to a point that you're getting commitments, like fundraising can be a huge slog. Uh, but there's considerably more power in the power dynamic that's in your favor as a founder than you may think. Let's actually, let's talk about this um, because I learned this, I would say the hard way earlier this year in regards to fundraising. Like if a founder, let's actually, let's stay with the same, the same example. It, would you consider it a positive signal if the founder is asking you these kinds of questions? And on the same note, um, how, when, when you're talking to a founder, are there certain signs that you know that this person's kind of got it versus signs that they don't how they, in regards to how they conduct their fundraising? Um, yeah. I mean, there, there are certain things that there are certain tactics that become popularized because of some big players in the space who will remain nameless uh, that make people use like these infomercial tactics when they're fundraising that might be like, call now, you know, if you call in the next 20 minutes, you can get a 15% discount, right? It's called a burning platform technique. And it's a, it's a well-known sales tactic. Uh, it's one that tends to rub us the wrong way uh, because it kind of comes off sleazy. You know, we're at, at this stage of the game, we do work pretty closely with our founders. Uh, you know, we're usually working with them pre-board. They don't have a board yet. Uh, we're working with them up to the point that they're raising a Series A. Uh, we don't want to be working with people who we think are going to be manipulative or are going to be using um, some dark tactics, right? You know, in, in the marketing world, there are these things called dark patterns, right? It's the idea like you log onto a website and it's got a like buy in the next 19 minutes and 99 seconds and you'll be able to get a 20% discount. And then you put, open up in like a private window and it's the same exact timer and it just restarts. Uh, there's the equivalent in, in sales and the equivalent in fundraising. And we, we try to avoid that kind of stuff, right? Uh, because any arena of ambition attracts to it a, a disproportionate percentage of people compared to the normal population. Uh, who have some of these like dark triad elements and traits, right? And those those people, it can be really good for them, but they can also be like really difficult to work with. And we want to work with people who <laughs> we enjoy working with and who will enjoy working with us, right? 
Um, as for like, is there any tell that shows us like, oh, they really got it? Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was on a call the other day with a team that we ended up making an offer to. Uh, it's a SaaS product and uh, the team I did actually have another institutional firm in an earlier round, which is a little bit unusual when we come in, but uh, we were talking to them about, you know, how much are you raising? Is there going to be enough room in the round for our, our typical check size? And they told us, you know, uh, well, you know, we went and we, we talked to our investors and we looked at the cap table and our investors and us agreed, like, we want to make room for you in the cap table, right? And that just shows that these people are going to be um, easier to work with, uh, that uh, they're people that we're going to want to be building a, a career long relationship with. Because we're working with founders, you know, when they're like 24 years old. So there's a very real possibility that when we're on like 15, 17, fund eight or whatever, uh, they can come back to us on their like fourth company, right? So does that make sense? Oh yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. It leads me to a, a question from a personal experience that I had uh, um, that I, I'm just wondering your perspective on. So about a year and a half ago, uh, one thing led to another and I was pitching this VC, uh, uh, this is before Jason, um, I was pitching this VC uh, in his office in San Francisco and uh, I, this is my first true exposure to any, this world at all, like never been to San Francisco before in the tech realm and uh, I guess I crush it and he's like, I really like you. I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but he's like, I'm interested. Let me know. Oh, we, he was, we, I told him I, I'm, we, I want to get into YC, but if we don't get into Y, but like, I don't know what to do with this timing. So he's like, how about this? If you get into YC, let me know. If you don't let me know with like a pretty much like, Hey, like I'm, I'm interested. And then I didn't know what to do after that. I like nailed the first impression. I guess I nailed the conversation, the pitch, but then after that it, it went cold. Like, like I, I followed up with him. I told him our progress, et cetera. And the enthusiasm just kind of went away. And then I realized in hindsight that I totally screwed it up, like the momentum stuff. Like what, what happens after you make the first impression, after the good first meeting? What is a founder supposed to do um, to keep up the momentum going and the fire, fire kindling to get that deal? I mean, one of the things that we try to do is we try to uh, give people a sense of what we are looking for when we make investments. And I tell people, like, keep me updated. And I, and I mean that. Uh, and yeah, I, ideally they throw me on like an update email list, things like that. Uh, and then they ping us when they're getting ready to fundraise. Right. Um, I don't like thinking about it in terms of momentum necessarily, because I, ideally we've known people a little bit longer that momentum isn't a major characteristic that we're looking for. We're trying to get to know them over an extended period of time. Um, so it's rather better to see, you know, did they listen to our feedback? Did they apply it or not? They don't have to apply it. Like, I don't know what I'm talking about half the time. Uh, but are they keeping us updated, right? Uh, that's that's more important for me. And like I said, we're fairly accessible. So if somebody is at a place where they're ready to fundraise, you know, uh, I had a phone call earlier today with a company that last time I talked to them was March 2019. Uh, and they said that they're putting together their pre-seed round. And I got on the phone with them, talked to them, asked them a few questions about their pre-seed round. Probably not a, a fit for us at this time, uh, but you know, I was able to tell them you know, what we would need to see again. Uh, and that's, that's the kind of way that we're often looking at these things. And how, how should a founder that just started, let's say a founder just started a company, yeah, they let you know they, they don't want to raise from you yet, but they just they just let you know. Like, let's say I start a company in a month, which I'm not, but let's say I I, I do. Uh, what is there? Like, do you have a kind of a common theme of what happens um, when a, when someone starts a company and then like eight months later they raise a fund? Or sorry, they raise they raise money. Is it really just about the updates, or is there a it more is there more conversation that happens as they get closer to an impending fundraise? Um, a little bit of both, right? Like uh, if they're just starting out, you know, they might talk to us and tell us a little bit about what they're working on. Well, in my case, uh, I'll tell them, you know, this is what the fundraising landscape looks like. I might talk a little bit about portfolio theory, like we talked about earlier, to let them know, like, hey, you know, this might be a really good company, but if you can't have an exit at like seven hundred million dollars plus in about a decade, like 
it's going to be hard for an early stage firm to come in. Um, and I, I tell them, you know, if you don't already have it, put together the, the monthly or quarterly uh, advisor update email, right? BCC me on it, uh, BCC other people you talk to at firms if they let you. Uh, and I prefer email for updates and phone call for like strategizing or phone call for like next steps, right? Uh, and that, and I, I tell them like, this is the stage at which we typically invest. We want to see a little bit of traction, uh, again, set aside for, you know, like deep tech companies. Uh, but we, we want to see a little bit of traction. Um, if that's on the enterprise side of things, it might mean a couple of paid pilots, uh, depending on what they're working on. So I get pitched, I wouldn't say very often, but semi-regularly on different SaaS tools for universities. And I think it's simply because we're, we are on university campuses and we're dealing with young people and people build products based on the problems they see around them. And I'll tell them like, look, I, I get pitched on things like this somewhat regularly. It's not uncommon for a university to tell you they'd like to do a pilot, but it is uncommon for them to tell you that they'll do a paid pilot, right? So if you can come back to me with a paid pilot, that's going to be really impressive. And so those are the kinds of things that uh, makes the, the conversation uh, have a flow to it. If we've known someone a longer period of time uh, and they're, they're in our community, you know, we keep a rolling community of people. We do events, socials, roundtables, things like that. Uh, and they come to us and they say, hey, you know, here's our, our traction. We're fundraising. We're hoping to raise the next couple of weeks or months. We might be able to get the ball rolling faster there because we've seen how they, they work as individuals over an extended period of time, right? Like the reality is people change and people evolve and they grow. We want to see like what that trajectory looks like, right? Yeah. How do you, how do you think about your deal flow? Um, what I mean by that is you probably get intros to, to founders, but you also probably have founders reaching out to you via cold email, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Facebook messenger, which I think how we got first connected, like how are these all, uh, if you don't know who they are, if it's cold, um, or cold or cold intro, are they all kind of the same level in your head or do you value intros more than messages or just like kind of, how do you feel about it? deal flow and what should founders know about how you look at incoming deals for you? I mean, we've done a handful of deals based off of people who are just completely cold inbound, right? So we have a form on our website uh, at 1517fund.com where people can uh, submit their idea and ask to talk with us. And probably half the phone calls I do in any given week are people who come through that, right? Um, now we don't we don't take every single uh, request that comes through that. We take the ones that make that they make sense given our thesis and where we focus on. Uh, but we we talk to a lot of people, right? Uh, I think as with any kind of relationship driven sale or event, uh, who you get an intro from does matter. Uh, you know, so if I if I have someone in my network who I know is very, very good at sending really, really interesting things to me, I'm much more likely to uh, doggedly follow that introduction than just somebody who's in my network. I'll take both introductions. Um, but whether or not it ends up resulting in like the next stage is a big factor of like who's referring people in, right? So for example, we have a company out of our first fund uh, called Entopology that was introduced to us uh, from one of the Teal Fellows. And uh, the, the guy that runs the company isn't a Teal Fellow. He actually falls outside of our thesis. I think he's got a math PhD, but one of the Teal Fellows said, this is the smartest guy I know. You should talk to him. So like that carries a lot of weight, right? Um, you know, any kind of relationship driven business is that way. Uh, I like cold outreach. Uh, I've got numerous blog posts on my website and on medium about like how to do it. Right. Um, you know, typically the thing that you have to do, you have to keep in mind is that VCs get a lot of cold outreach, uh, and you want any cold email you send to them to look like it's written for them. If you could copy and paste the same email and send it to another firm, uh, and without changing anything, that means that you haven't done a good enough job writing it typically. 
Uh, so that, that's the difference between cold emails and spam in my mind. Like if I could look at a, an email that comes in, I could send it to any other firm in town and it would still make sense. It's probably closer to the spam side of the spectrum. Um, but we have a specific thesis. Uh, we have a very specific focus. So if someone reaches out to us that they meet our thesis and our focus, we'll, we'll talk to them. Uh, if they're particularly, if they've done their homework on us, that helps a lot, right? Like it's much, much easier to say like, okay, we're gonna talk to this person than someone who looks like they're just filling out the same form on every single VC website that they come across. And uh, in regards to people that, let's say they contact you cold and you have a call and it's one of those people that, one of those companies where you say, just keep me updated, like put me on your monthly update. Um, something that I used once successfully and have considered doing, doing you know, again, for whatever I start next is put people on the, so it's going to sound bad that I mentioned now I'm talking about it, but like pretty much putting VCs on your monthly update before they opt in simply because like a VC isn't going to be like, they're not going to be angry that a startup is giving them progress. But as I say it out loud, I feel like that could be like kind of bad. I don't know. How do you feel about if, if someone randomly just put, started putting you on the monthly update without you um, kind of opting in? Um, I, I mean, it's if, if I didn't make the offer or they didn't raise it to me, my first question is going to be like, when did I talk to this team? And I'll probably search my inbox to figure out when I did. Uh, the, the easiest way around that, I, I wouldn't be offended, um, but the easiest way around that is at the end of your phone call, ask like, is it okay if I add you to like my BCC update that I send, you know, send me regularly? I, I think it's pretty rare that people are going to say no. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and if someone is in kind of a similar position to, uh, to me in that like they, uh, they don't necessarily know what company they want to start. They maybe just got out of a company and just exited, et cetera, but they're pretty much just kind of like hanging out. What, um, would you, would you advise people before they need the really like, sorry, let me back up. You say it's a relationship game. It's all about like, the people that you know and, and your relationships with them. What can someone not actively fundraising do to make their fundraise easier once they, once they get started with that? Do interesting things, right? Uh, the people who I've seen fundraise quickly, uh, you know, there are two camps of them. One is they're just super well connected. Uh, they, they front loaded the work, you know, they went around, maybe they worked for a firm or they worked for a, a larger um, company that uh, had a lot of former employees who went to go work for firms. That's one group of people. The other group, the other group of people, it's like, they, they're doing, they've done a lot of customer discovery. They're interesting. Uh, and they're able to get an advocate or two who's really happy to give them a ton of introductions. That, that matters, right? Um, the thing you don't want to do is you don't want to just be going to networking events. So I would say don't do that. And that friend or that person that's your advocate, kind of the person that can intro you to all the, the quote unquote, what I call like insiders. How, you know, let's say someone lives in, I don't know, Omaha, Nebraska. I don't know if there's a giant tech scene there. If there could be, but I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna guess that it's not giant. If someone, you know, lives there and they want to raise from funds like yours or funds like from San Francisco or New York, and they really just have no, there's no one to get them that in. Um, do you have any advice for people not on the inside for, for like to like kind of get the attention of the VCs that may not be in their ecosystems and they're not one or two degrees away from them? Yeah. Um, the long-term advice is, you know, go get a job that allows you to be in either tangential to or in those industries. So that was helpful for me. Uh, I had a job that allowed me to, that was tangential to the startup world. Uh, and that's what allowed me to meet a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, you know, the shorter term advice is you could, and I've seen this work for people. I you know I, I'm not in our San Francisco office. I'm only out there like maybe once a quarter. Uh, but I've seen people who like, they just put a trip together to San Francisco and they uh, email a bunch of VCs and they see who will sit down with them, right? Like your response rate is going to be pretty low, uh, but you send enough emails and you can at least start meeting people. 
Um, the other thing is like try to try to go to like events that their primary purpose is not networking, right? I hate networking events. Like I, I think it's very, 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 very rare that you find uh, quality people in networking events. You usually find like life insurance salespeople and uh, unemployed people. Um, but what you what can be useful are events whose primary purpose is not networking. Conferences can be in this category, so maybe it's like TechCrunch, right? Um, or you know, we hold socials and we tell people like look, we have to cap the number of attendees at our socials simply because of fire codes. Uh, but people are allowed to invite guests if there's still availability on the list when they sign up. And people meet us through that, right? That's a big part of it. If you truly have no connections, really the best thing is, is cold email. Like learn how to write a really good cold email and start sending emails. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of funny just because I kind of, just just for people listening, I guess I'll take a crack at, at this question too. Like, you know, three years ago, I was in, I mean, I, I'm living in Phoenix, Arizona, and I had no connections at all. And uh, Zach is totally right. What I did is I did, I, you know, I emailed maybe 20 VCs that I had this company with like seven, you know, it was like 700 MRR at the time. It was like nothing. Um, I just like kept emailing the emailing and it's just kind of added up. And now, uh, you know, now... I'm a little more as of an insider than I was a year ago, which is, which is fun. Um, a couple, a couple more questions for you before we wrap it up. What is there? I kind of already asked this question in one way, but I, I want to approach it in a different way. I guess, is there an X factor for you in founders or is the X factor in market or is it, is it, Team, I guess, what do you put the most value on when you make it an investment? Market, founder, overall team, product, et cetera. What do you value the most? Probably founder highest, but the way to think about this though would be like, there are certain things that are necessary but not sufficient conditions, right? Market is a necessary condition. Uh, so going back to the portfolio theory question, uh, a, a company has to under some kind of narrative be in a venture scalable market and those are just massive markets right so the narrative might be that you'll grow the market but it needs to be a compelling narrative that you'll somehow grow it right um airbnb is a classic example of that is they they actually grew the like home host market uh and they eat up part of the hotel market right um, so that's a necessary condition uh, but a where fundamentally an early stage firm, a lot of the teams we're working with, their products will change, um, their markets may even change. Uh, so we really look at the founders. Um, I, the quickest I've seen us make investments is pretty quickly in people that we've known for years, right? There are people like one of my colleagues uh, recently, uh, two of my colleagues recently sat down uh, with a company that we recently invested in and they made an offer to do a small investment on the spot. We almost never do that. But the reason why we did that was we've known this founder for a very long time. And we, to put it in uh, the words of one of my colleagues, we've been looking for an opportunity to work with this guy, right? So on one hand, it's like a really quick uh, investment decision. On the other hand, it's like a, like a six year investment decision, right? Um, so founder is fundamentally going to be the, the, the thing at the core of it. If we can't get past the founder being like the person to be doing this people, a person we really want to be working with, um, you can have market, you can have technology, you can have product, and we're not going to want to make the investment. Um, but if you have a founder working on something that's really interesting, um, unless there's some way that it fits into the portfolio, uh, it, it's going to need to be under that venture scalable market kind of condition. And my last question for you before we wrap it up is, can you let me know what the number one thing is that you wish founders knew when they pitch you that they don't know? Kind of maybe the biggest mistake they make um, that if they didn't make that mistake, it would change potentially some of the outcomes. Um, it, it depends on how we're being introduced to that person. So if it's someone who they either come to us cold or I meet them on campus somewhere, uh, I, I wish that 
it, they would be a little bit more cognizant of our focus on uncredentialed founders, dropout founders, people like that. That helps a lot. Uh, I've been on phone calls where I've asked people like, did you graduate? And they're like, yes, actually I've got three master's degrees. It's like, I know that you think that that sounds impressive, <laughs> but you're talking to the wrong person. Um, so that that's helpful if people know that uh, because we really do try to stick to that thesis where we can. Outside of that, uh, the thing that is really, really helpful too is if people understand the incentives that investors are facing, if they understand portfolio theory, if they understand the idea of venture scalability. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I, I meet people fairly regularly who have great companies, products, visions, whatever. And I think that they're going to make great founders, uh, but they are not doing something that's venture scalable, which if they don't want to do something that's venture scalable, that's fine. I don't want them to go do like a venture scalable problem just to get venture investment. Um, but sometimes, especially with founders who haven't been through this game before, it's less common for them to understand or already be familiar with uh, how that venture scalability factor works. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate uh, appreciate that answer, um, and I appreciate you coming on to the podcast. I uh, um, honestly learned a ton uh, about raising money and just how to interact with with VCs, and I hope people listening learned a ton as well. So, um, thank you so much for coming on, Zach. And, yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to reach out to me, I'm just z a k at one five one seven fund dot com, uh, and then our website's. 1517fund.com, 1517fund. All right, there you all have it. Hope you have a great rest of your day, Zach. Cool. Thanks, Matt. See ya.